Hi there, uh, I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm happy to welcome you to this Distinguished Author Series virtual event featuring Richard Haas, author of The World, A Brief Introduction. We also welcome your participation, and for those joining us in the webinar, we'll be collecting questions for the question and answer period please use the Q&A feature located next to the participants icon on the bottom of the screen to submit questions. We'll be answering them towards the end of the session. This webinar is being recorded and will be accessible via the IPI website for future viewing. Richard Haas is an experienced American diplomat, policymaker, author, teacher, and frequent contributor in the press and on television as those of you who follow Morning Joe know. And he is in his 17th year as president of the Council on Foreign Relations. He served as the senior Middle East advisor to President George H. W. Bush, director of the policy planning staff under Secretary of State Colin Powell, and the United States envoy to both the Cyprus and Northern Ireland peace talks. The World, A Brief Introduction, is the 15th book that Richard has written or edited. And in the case of the last four, he's developed a habit that we here at IPI applaud. Once the book is written, Richard accepts our invitation to come here to talk about it. Over the past decade, we've had more than 50 distinguished authors speak at IPI book events, and Richard is the first to make the visit four times. We normally have a pile of the author's books for sale at these events, but in this case, we included the purchase link in our invitation. And obviously lots of people have already found their way to it, since I'm told the book is about to enter the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list at number 10. I am a longtime admirer of Richard Haas for the things he does and the things he writes. And I'm really happy to welcome him back to IPI. Thank you, Warren. It's good to be uh, good to be back. I feel like a recidivist, however. <laughs> That's right. Well, if you did as you do as well as you did the first three times, we'll be, we'll be in good shape. Uh, you, you will get another invitation for your sixteenth book, uh, Richard. This book is characteristically rich in well curated, useful information, and it's very readable, but more didactic than others you have written. We refer to it as a primer in the invitation to this event. Why you chose to write it that way emerges in an interesting story you tell in the book of a meaningful encounter with a young college student. So why don't you start the conversation there? Sure, I'd be happy to. And again, thank you. Look, the story begins uh, on a boat one day. Uh, uncharacteristically, I was going fishing up in New Nantucket. And I met this uh, very smart young man who was about to enter his senior year at Stanford. And he was, uh, I learned a computer sciences major. And I said, look, we can't have much of a conversation about computer sciences given what I don't know. But I said, I'm curious, uh, how many history courses have you taken? And he kind of looked a little bit awkward and said, well, actually I haven't taken any general history courses. And then I said, well, what about economics? No, I haven't taken any of those. And I said, what about political science? And same answer. And what was clear to me was this very bright young man was going to graduate fully prepared in the realm of computer society, sciences, but completely unprepared for the world he was going to uh, be entering. And it wasn't clear to me about how he would be in a position to vote in a considered uh, way or deal with international issues. When I went back to my office at the council, uh, a little bit of research showed that this was anything but the exception. You can graduate from virtually every high school in this country and not be exposed to anything serious about the contemporary world. And you can graduate from virtually any two or four year college or university in the country, the same thing. Now, don't get me wrong, Warren. Courses about the world are offered on just about every campus, often dozens of them. The problem is almost none of them are required for graduation. So the artful student, and all students tend to be artful by a certain stage, he or she can navigate requirements and essentially manage to avoid again, more or less illiterate in the ways of this world that are gonna so fundamentally uh, affect their lives. And 
you can get a lot of information, uh, the newspaper you used to work for, the New York Times and others, but you can now watch the nightly news and come away essentially, again, not really understanding or knowing what is, what is going on. And what I decided to do was write a book for people of any age, whether they're 20 or 40 or 60 or what have you, uh, to essentially try to narrow the gap between what I thought people needed to know about the world, whether to vote in an informed way, to uh, judge public policy debates, someone puts a tariff on, I'm a worker, is that a good, bad, bad thing for me? To make investment decisions, business decisions, travel decisions, essentially to give people something of a foundation so they can make sense of some of the information coming at them, some of the, uh, some of the decisions uh, coming at them that, that deal again with this world that as we've learned in the last few months is uh, not something we can uh, shut out of our lives even if we wanted to. You know, you're mentioning uh, television news. You'll remember, Richard, a great old friend of mine and of yours, Garrick Utley of NBC News. About 25 years ago, he published a magazine piece in which he recorded how many minutes of each night, sort of 30 minutes, was devoted to foreign affairs. And I think it was like about seven or eight or nine. Uh, imagine if you did that test right now. Um, uh, is this seven, an seven, advice? seven or eight or nine would be uh, tremendous progress? I know, and that's what it used to be. And he was writing about it at that point, saying, "This is how bad it's gotten." Uh, um, Richard, uh, is this an indictment of American education? I mean, what should be being taught aside from the fact that you mentioned there are not requirements? Um, what else would you make sure the curriculum had? I think it is something of an indictment, and I think also it shows. One of the things I'm hoping to come out of this book is a little bit of a national conversation about what we want citizens to know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's been a big movement in recent years about STEM, giving people technical backgrounds. But I'd like every high school or college graduate to have the basic of what you and I used to call civics, to understand how our democracy functions, uh, what is the American idea, what is in the Constitution, the Federalist Papers, the Tocqueville, and all that. I'd want I'd like to think the optimist in me thinks that some of the troubles we're going through in our country would not be as severe if there was a greater understanding of the political DNA that is the United States of America. I'd also like every student to have, again, a foundational understanding of this world. Uh, think about it, Warren. Anyone who's young uh, going to college now, he or she will have been born around the turn of this century. If they have a normal, healthy lifespan, will essentially have a 21st century life. They have got to be better prepared than they uh, they than they currently are. If again, they're going to be the kind of active citizens they need to be, looking out for their own uh, self-interest. So I would say, parents, if you're shelling out all this money for your kid to go to school, start insisting that this degree give your young person and your family what he or she uh, really needs. That to me would be a, a start. I also have, at the risk of getting political, I uh, I do not understand the opposition in the United States to national standards or, or curriculum. The idea that someone in, in Massachusetts should have a different understanding of either the country or the world than someone in Florida or Texas or California baffles me. There's only one constitution, there's only one world. So I don't understand why, uh, why we're, we, we're so against putting in national requirements on these issues. Um, Richard, uh... You, um, you wrote the book long before COVID-19 showed up, but you weren't caught completely by surprise because in the book you say in your section on global health, you write, uh, quote, a large scale global epidemic, a pandemic cannot be discounted. And it is possible that a particularly virulent form could emerge one season and quickly go global. This virus has shaken the world that you are writing about. What is it showing us about that world and about this moment in international relations that we're living through? Well, the first thing, Warren, I think it shows uh, is that nothing stays local for long. Indeed, even the word local is in some ways misleading. In this case, it was Wuhan. On 9-11, it was remote parts of Afghanistan. Uh, there's an interconnectedness in this world. And the corollary is that globalization is a reality. Just about everything, one way or another, travels uh, across borders with tremendous uh, velocity. Uh, 
uh, often in, in, in great volume. Now, how we respond to globalization, that's a, that's a choice and that's where policy comes in. But I think the, the beginning of wisdom uh, about this pandemic is that uh, it's a part of globalization. It's not a one-off. This time it was COVID-19. The day will come when it's COVID-23 or it'll be some bacteria that emerges that is resistant to, to antibiotics. And again, this is not an exception. This is what it is like to live in a world defined by globalization. And, and the lesson is that uh, you know, the oceans that surround this country are not moats. We can talk about sovereignty until we're blue in the face, but no amount of American sovereignty kept out COVID-19. No amount of American sovereignty keeps out the, the greenhouse gases that cause uh, climate change. Sovereignty didn't protect us from 9-11, from and I could go down the, uh, the list. So we've got to essentially reject uh, isolationism. We've got to have a serious conversation about how to deal with the various ramifications of a 21st century world. Uh, Richard, two days ago, you tweeted that the U.S. appeared, quote, divided, diminished, and distracted, and said it's hard to believe at this moment of vulnerability we won't be challenged by someone, somehow, somewhere. Who do you have in mind? Well, let me, let me get to that in 30 seconds. Uh, look, I'm worried this combination of the pandemic, the economic aftershocks, what do we have now? 40 million Americans unemployed, trillions of dollars of wealth have gone. And now on top of that, we have all the political dish, uh, divisiveness, violence in the aftermath of the killing of uh, Mr. Floyd. And then we had this sort of event that happened Monday night in Lafayette Park in, in Washington. This, this country is weakened. It is uh, divided. It is uh, distracted. Well, I don't know, but I would think that some of what China is doing possibly now in Hong Kong or along its border with India would qualify. The rhetoric on Taiwan coming out of China has clearly been dialed up. Uh, we'll see what a, a North Korea might choose to do, what an Iran might choose to do, what a Russia might choose to do. I mean, I worry that our foes could be tempted. I don't, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but they, they must be sitting in their, their equivalent of the situation room discussing whether an opportunity, a moment has, has arrived. And I expect some of our friends and allies are particularly uneasy. They're sitting around saying, wow, can we count on the United States? We already had doubts before this. We already had doubts given this president's uh, bashing of alliances, what he did vis-a-vis -vis the Kurds, the, uh, the, 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 the agreement that's been negotiated vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Taliban in uh, Afghanistan. So suddenly American reliability has become an issue. And I would think that this, uh, this, this adds steroids to it. Mm. Richard, um, China and the U.S., you write about the Sino-American relationship now being in what you call its fourth phase. And one of the complicating characteristics of the current phase is the deterioration of the relationship between the two countries. Do you think we're headed for a new Cold War? And is containment, the strategy in the last Cold War, an option in this one? And you like to talk about the tyranny of the inbox. Isn't management of the relationship with China likely to be the most consequential diplomatic challenge in the inbox of the new president in January? Uh, maybe, no, and yes. Uh, I have to remember your three questions now that I've given the three uh, answer. Uh, could we end up in a Cold War with China? Sure. It takes two to tango. In this case, it will take two not to tango. And that will require some serious statecraft, diplomatic deftness, D-E-F-T, N-E-S-S, -S, on the part of both sides. That's been conspicuously missing from both. No, is it, again, it's possible. It's not inevitable. Uh, it would clearly be undesirable. I would simply say that it would leave us much, much worse off in dealing with problems ranging from, say, North Korea to climate change to future pandemics. So, if we end up in a Cold War with China, I think it's a major loss for both countries and for the world, but it's, it's, it's a possibility. The good news is it's not an inevitably, inevitability. Your second question, was, it, uh, was containment potentially useful? Uh, no, China's way too integrated. The Soviet Union essentially opted out 
of what we all called the liberal world order, particularly the economic side and the political side. And we, we had a policy of containment because the Soviet Union was largely a military threat and we had to push back wherever it appeared. Now we have to push back against China militarily if that becomes an issue. But in some other cases, China's way too integrated in the world economy. It's already there, you can't contain it. The real question in many cases will be, can we compete with it? Can we structure the competition on terms that we believe are, uh, are favorable to ourselves? Those will be the policy questions. But China is a much more uh, multi-dimensional international actor than, than the Soviet Union was or than, uh, than Russia uh, is. And now I've forgotten your third question, Warren. I knew, I, I knew that was going to happen. I'd never get all three. I, I think you answered the third one first, by I said is, won't this management of this particular problem oh, be, high in the inbox. be in the top of the famous inbox? Well, the, I don't know. I would say it ought to be one of the two most pressing uh, priorities. The other would be the management of global issues, you know, climate and so forth. But I would say, yeah, I would think uh, trying to reach some sort of a strategic understanding with China would be important. Now, the way to get there, by the way, won't just take you to Beijing. The most important thing to do might be certain stops in Europe, Tokyo, Seoul, and in Australia, uh, to approach China, not unilaterally, but with our allies and partners with us. It's one of the reasons that I argue so strongly the United States should become a member of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I would hope after the uh, election, we will find our way into the organization that it, it gave subsequent birth to. Uh, but yes, this has to be a priority. They, look, this relationship will go a long ways towards determining the character of the 21st century. And if the United States and China do end up in a Cold War, it is a far, far worse century than it would be if we had a relationship that at least allowed, like I'm not naive, I've been around the block a few times. So my goal is not kumbaya here. My goal is a relationship where we, uh, it, that at least allows selective cooperation, even in a context of widespread uh, competition. And that seems to me the challenge for, for diplomacy. Can we structure it so we have inevitable competition, but it doesn't spill over and preclude, again, say, cooperating on a regional or global challenge where we have some overlapping interests. Mm -hmm. um, just talking about China still, China itself uh, is not completely secure. I'm thinking about the fact, first of all, they have 1.3 billion people. Uh, there's insecurity right there in that number. They're overextended in the developing world. Uh, they have more than $500 billion in belt and road program loans alone, which countries probably cannot pay back. Its own people are agitated. And then there is Hong Kong and up to 1 million Uyghurs in mass detention camps in Xinjiang. Can China maintain control, control and is it in the U.S. interest to make sure they do? It's really two big questions. The, the first question is being hotly, hotly debated by real China hands. And I'll, as you and anyone watching this has already figured out, I am not a real China hand. I don't speak and read Mandarin. I'm a generalist who was forced to learn something about China, who in the age when we could travel would go there you know, several times uh, a year. And I've been going there for, I don't know what, four decades now. Uh, there is a school of thought that China is vulnerable. You got an aging population. You have all the demographic consequences of the uh, ill-advised one-child policy. You've got terrible environmental de degradation, real public health problems. You've got a leadership that now is incredibly concentrated. Look, we saw the criticism uh, of Xi Jinping in the initial weeks of the uh, after the outbreak of the virus in. Uh, in uh, China, his anti-corruption drive has created all sorts of internal uh, enemies. And they are so worried about things like Hong Kong. So I think they are worried about the centrifugal forces in their country. And they're worried about the slowing economy because they've lost some of the lubricant to help keep things uh, calm. So I think China faces real challenges. Uh, to me, though, the goal of American foreign policy, like we're, we're not going to have much impact on whether China succeeds or not. But the goal of our foreign policy is not in any way to hurt China. I'd say it's not to stop its rise. It's to help direct its rise. We want China is going to be what China is going to be. The real question is how they use their power.
So I don't want to see a situation where 1.3 billion people is chaos. I don't think that's in the interest of the world or the United States. Economically, that would hurt us. It would hurt us in dealing with any number of regional and global issues. So I don't want China to fail. But I want it to use its growing power in a responsible way. That, to me, is the challenge of American foreign policy. Richard, about climate change, you write in the book that this could be, quote, the defining issue of this century, unquote. And that the question is no longer whether it exists, but instead, what should we do about it? How do you answer that question? I've been thinking about it a lot. Uh, I don't think the sort of approach we've had is likely to work. I mean, up to now, for the last couple of decades, since climate change became an issue, though you and I are both old enough to remember when international relations took place without climate change on the agenda, but that just is more commentary on how old we both are. The, uh, I don't think it's gonna be resolved in international conferences with 190 countries trying to come up with a single scheme that's going to limit it. And over the years, you've had things like cap and trade, global carbon tax, now you have Paris, and uh, both wisdom and limits of Paris, it doesn't impose anything on anybody. It lets each country decide what its national contribution is going to be, what its trajectory is going to be, and then we add it all up. And the problem with Paris is when you add it all up, even if everybody did what they said they were going to do, it wouldn't be close to what the world needs. And on top of that, everybody's not going to do when they, uh, what they committed uh, to doing. So that's to suggest to me you need another approach. And I would suggest two or three things. One would be that, right, to take, exam take advantage of the current situation. If we're shelling out billions of dollars to help companies get back on their feet, why don't we introduce some climate-related conditions? If you're an automobile company and you're going to get this kind of help, why shouldn't we demand that you, you agree to certain uh, fuel efficiency standards? Or if you're a company uh, that you, you agree to certain, you know, not to use coal. As you're, so I think there's one way, again, regulation, at the national level is a big thing. Uh, there's an article in a recent issue of uh, Foreign Affairs by Professor Nordhaus essentially saying we should get together with our allies and partners and essentially come up with a, a climate tax, it's essentially telling the Chinas or Indias of the world, look, you want to export to us, great. But if, it, if we see that you are fueling your exports, if you're producing your exports using, say, coal or what have you, we're going to slap a, a tax on it. Uh, a tariff, or basically a climate tariff. And if it's not something the United States can or should do alone, but if we joined TPP and got other countries to affiliate, and we had 60% of the world's economy agreeing to something like that, we'd, we'd have an awful lot of, uh, an awful lot of leverage. Lastly, uh, Warren, I think uh, what's called climate adaptation or resilience is a big issue. We have to assume that no matter what we do, climate change has happened, is happening, will happen. Uh, and we've got to restructure some of our societies to make, uh, it's like where people live, where insurance is provided and so forth. I left out one thing. You know what else I do? I'd go to uh, Mr. Bolsonaro, the president of uh, Brazil. And I would basically say, it turns out that most of the Amazon rainforest is on your territory, but the Amazon rainforest is not yours to destroy. It is an important resource for all of mankind. As a result, we will help you if you want to preserve it. But if you persist in destroying it, we will penalize you badly. And I would say, I, I would hope there would be uh, trade consequences. I would like to see consumer boycotts of Brazilian uh, goods. I think what Brazil is doing is uh, they may have the sovereign right to do it, but it's, it's irresponsible in terms, in terms of its impact on the world. Um, Richard, I want to talk about Russia. Uh, Putin is vulnerable with his popularity falling a terrible public health program compounded by a bad case of COVID, an economy dependent upon oil at a time when falling prices and abundance of oil. But he's been playing a bad hand pretty well, all things considered, and he has all those nuclear weapons, so he has to be taken seriously, yes? Where should, uh, a, new, well, I can say, where should a new president, or maybe the same one, be taking that relationship? And should Russia be let back into the G7? Well, a couple of questions and I'll unpack it. Uh, look, I think Russia is still a superpower in one realm, obviously nuclear weapons. The current New START agreement expires a few weeks after the president takes office, whether it's a second term for Mr. Trump or first term for Mr. Biden. I would think extending that 
is the right thing to do. The last thing we need, given everything else on our collective plates, is a new round of strategic nuclear competition. We can decide down the road how we deal with new systems not covered by STAR, how we deal with China and other third parties. But for now, I think we need a lid on U.S.-Russian uh, nuclear competition. I would uh, and also, I think there's nothing wrong with diplomacy with Russia. I'll, I'm old-fashioned, Warren. I've never thought that diplomacy was a favor. I've never thought it was a gift. So I would be happy to talk with Mr. Uh, Putin. I'd like to think there might be a note taker in the room and uh, maybe an NSC staffer, but I think it's, it's fine to talk to Mr. Uh, Putin again. It's not, diplomacy is a form, of, it's, it's a form of national security. So I think we should. Again, I never, I wouldn't kick them out of the, I, know, I didn't favor kicking them out of the G, G, G8 at the time. Again, I would have much rather the other seven countries beat up on the Russians, uh, impose, we're gonna impose sanctions and all that. But I never understood how not talking to them uh, hurt them, uh, never was obvious to me. Um, I think the, the other serious issue besides what they're doing in the Middle East and elsewhere will be their interference in our elections. I would issue a really stern warning. They've never stopped, by the way, in interfering. I would do what we can to protect ourselves, but then I would look not just at sanctions, but I would look at, uh, are there things we might do that would make Mr. Putin's life miserable at home? And you know, he cares more than anything about his own political position. He wants to be president for life. He's had a postponement recently, his move to get the political backing for it. But I would, uh, I would be willing to look at cyber tools in order to complicate his life. Um, uh, Europe, uh, Richard, you identify in the book the NATO alliance and the project of European integration as the, quote, two great undertakings of the post-World War II era. But you acknowledge that both NATO and European Union have lost critical support. I assume you think the United States should do all it can do to shore up the European Union. How should it do that? Well, actually, I think we can do, we should do all we can to shore up NATO. I don't think it's really... The European Union is not ours to shore up. I think we should stop banging on it. I think we should stop criticizing it. But it's really up to the Europeans. The good news, and you know, Warren, I hope you're sitting down because I'm associated with the words good news so rarely. But I think there is some good news coming out of Europe. I think the British, French-led European Commission recovery plan for Europe, 750 billion with the B euros, is a big idea because what it suggests is that the richest countries, most powerful countries in Europe are prepared to do things for the others. Now it has to be worked out, what conditionality and the rest, but this is the first sign of a revival in collectivism in Europe where all the trends have been going the other way, most dramatically with Brexit. And you've had all sorts of talks of countries going their own way. So in the book, I'm quite downbeat and I'm quite worried about what was going on in Europe and I still am, but this is, this is a good but. This is, again, the first sign of life that, and it's interesting, it came from the two countries, France and Germany, that were there uh, at the beginning. They were the core. They were the whole raison d'etre uh, for the European, at that point, the coal and steel community. It was to so knit together the major economies of Europe that war would become unthinkable. So I actually think it's really welcome that these two economies have emerged under Merkel and Macron to basically take the lead in strengthening a trans-European effort. So I, again, I'm a lot of bad news out there, but I actually took this as an interesting piece of good news. Richard, IPI uh, is not an advocacy organization, but we do champion multilateralism. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, I suspect we at IPI are all in the word that President Trump disparaged when he spoke at the UN a couple of years ago, quote, globalist, unquote. I even suspect you might be one too. Uh, in your chapter on alliances and coalitions, you devote some time to talking about the importance of NGOs and nonprofits and philanthropies and research institutes. I like reading this part of your book, by the way, and private business in addition to the United Nations. And this audience, I'm sure, would be interested in your thoughts on that and on the practice of multilateralism in general going forward. I think it's true. I mean, think about right now, if you were having a meeting on the pandemic, you'd be crazy not to include the Gates and Bloomberg foundations, uh, not to include some of the pharmaceutical companies, some of the biotech companies, groups like maybe Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, the IRC. And what this shows is 
you know, the, the, the central or at times most critical units are not just nation states. Yeah, there's 100, what, 192, 193 of them. But there's all sorts of organizations, regional and global, but then there are NGOs, companies, what have you. And they've all got an important uh, uh, role to play. And I think what that means for multilateralism is we've got to be flexible. And you just got to be practical. And the first question you've always got to ask yourself is, who is relevant and who might be willing and able to make a difference here. So it's a version of the coalition of the willing, but I call it coalition of the willing, able, and relevant. Uh, that's, that's war, we'll have to call whatever it is. We'll, we'll come up with something better than that. But, uh, but, the, uh, but that's essentially what I think we need. So with every global challenge, I think we should really be into what you might call, or others would call designer multilateralism. We ought not to get hung up on G this or General Assembly that, but we ought to be really practical because for different issues, you want different parties in the room. So we've actually done a bit of it with Iran. We've had one group with North Korea, we've had another, but I think we ought to take that concept and essentially apply it to virtually every regional and global challenge. Uh, Richard, one last question before we go to get questions. And it's, it's about the menace of cyber attacks and cyber war. It's common for people to say we need rules of the road, but you say in the book, those favoring establishing rules are losing out to fast changing technologies. And then you discuss some alternative strategies. What are they? Well, again, I, I'm worried that the technology is changing so fast and that it's in so many hands and there's no consensus. I mean, you or I, if we sat down to the extent we understood it, we may say we want to have this about the free flow of ideas, or well, the Chinese and others are going to raise their hands and say no, or the Russians are going to say no. What I would begin with, again, is uh, it's the reason I think alliances and partnerships are so important, Warren, is I would begin with them, maybe with the companies, and start thinking about what is it we want. And again, we, we may not be able to get a, a global arrangement there. But at a minimum, we want to get a consensus among the, the like-minded. And what we could do is come up with a common set of uh, regulations, almost rules of the road for the part of cyberspace we control. And we could agree on what penalties we would impose on those who, who violated them. But I, I think at the end of the day, this will remain a messy world. Uh, I don't, you know, with something like nuclear weapons, thank God, it's still only nine countries that have them and, 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 the one, and only two have enormous arsenals. The problem with cyber is the, the entry costs are so low. There are now so many actors, plus it's very hard often to know who's doing the acting. It's very hard, uh, what's called attribution. If a missile comes launched at us, we know who launched it. If a cyber attack gets launched at us, we often don't. So the, the regulatory hurdles or challenges are, are, are so much harder, harder. So then you basically say, what can we do with the like-minded? But also then I think we need to be much more resi uh, resilience oriented. Think about protection, think about redundancies and so forth. Uh, I think that's true increasingly of a lot of issues, whether it's terrorism or global health. We're not gonna be, you know, th this idea of invulnerability is nonsense. Invulnerability is unachievable. You're always going to have degrees of it. You obviously want to reduce your vulnerability, but you have to assume that you can't prevent all attacks and you have to assume you can't stop all attacks once they're underway. Every once in a while, attacks are going to succeed and that's where resilience uh, becomes such an important feature of a, of a modern society. All right, I'm now, this is a moment of technological challenge. Uh, I'm looking at some of the questions, and uh, I'm going to ask them of you just here in one second, Richard. Um, okay. Well, you partially, there's a very good question from a colleague of mine, uh, Emily Green, and you partially answered it. It's about, China. let me just see. Um, well, on, on while areas, uh, Emily writes, while areas of U.S. Chinese competition are widely reported, which issues do you think are the most promising for U.S. China cooperation? It's a good question. I constantly ask that. I, I've got a few on my list. One is North Korea, obviously. I don't see how China's helped by a North Korea that has nuclear weapons, uh, lest at some point some of North Korea's neighbors decide they want them too, which would be a strategic nightmare for uh, 
China, so that's one. Afghanistan, China was a member of the old six plus two group, uh, borders on Afghanistan. It is a stake in uh, Afghanistan being stable, not becoming a major source of either terror or drugs. Uh, I would think climate change is an obvious uh, issue. Global public health ought to be uh, an issue. So I've actually got a, a fairly healthy list of things the United States and China could cooperate on, at least in, in principle, because there is some overlapping of uh, self-interest. And again, there's all the areas where we don't have overlaps in our interests. And the question is, again, can we contain, to use that word, uh, or box some of those inevitable differences so it doesn't preclude some limited cooperation. Um, Emily has sent another question. And Richard, by the way, Emily is, is a student now at SEPA up at Columbia. So she, not, she, <laughs> she is not one of those young Americans who you fret about who don't really understand the world. She's, she understands it and she's pursuing uh, studies in it. But she asked on, on, on back on cyber tools, she says, how do you propose ensuring emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence are harnessed to help rather than harm? There is no way of ensuring it, sorry. Virtually any technology in, the, in, the, in human history has potentially uh, benign and malign applications. The technology is, is a tool. Uh, a lot of stuff that could do wonderful things for medicine could also get involved in biological uh, warfare. Certain, you know, depending on how military systems are used, they can help deter and keep the peace, or they can help fight and start and, and conduct uh, wars. Uh, cars are wonderful things. They get us places. They also kill, what, 30, 35,000 Americans a year. So, we can, yeah, my point is simply that technology is very hard to, to harness and to say, it can only be used X, particularly if it's a technology that's decentralized. Uh, if it's a heavily centralized technology, then it's easy to, to monitor it uh, and to follow what's happening. But to the extent things can happen in garages or in tunnels, uh, you know, uh, where individual you know, hackers can do certain things or a cell phone could do something, by the time you get truly distributed technologies, proliferated technologies, uh, very, very hard to deal with the, uh, the consequence. And you have to assume that AI uh, will have a positive and negative uh, uses. Indeed, we're already seeing that. So China's using AI in certain ways to clearly limit individual freedom, to strengthen the state vis-a-vis -vis the individual. But AI will also do all sorts of wonderful things in medicine with life-saving applications. So I think, but I don't know any way of, of since it's so distributed or decentralized, I don't know any way of, to use Emily's word, ensuring it's only used in benign ways. Indeed, you probably couldn't even get an agreement, a universal agreement on what constitutes benign. Um, uh, Richard, a question from Ahmed Gad, uh, an Egyptian. Uh, with the current circumstances, how will the pandemic affect the foreign policy of the big powers? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I wrote an article for our magazine for foreign affairs, foreign affairs maybe two months ago, how I thought it would accelerate history. So essentially a lot of the trends that we saw in the world before any of us ever heard of COVID-19, I think all those trends are there still. They're just more, uh, they're accentuated, they're more intense in some ways they've picked up uh, pace. I think uh, I, for the United States, I would say I'm worried because it's not just in isolation, the pandemics, the pandemic, the economic aftershocks, and now it's the, uh, it's the, um, sorry, um, it's the, the, the protests we're seeing. Um, and I worry that it will really leave this country quite divided, quite weakened, quite distracted. So I worry about the bandwidth, I don't know a better word, uh, for staying focused on the world and staying involved in the world. So I worry that the United States might be particularly vulnerable to being affected by the uh, pandemic. And, 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 give, and also, again, it's not taking place in isolation, given the economic trials we now face, as well as what's going on in our streets. Uh, Richard, you were asked uh, to brief then-candidate Donald Trump in 2016. Mm -hmm. And judging by the results, he completely ignored your advice. 
um, what was his view of America's role in the world at that time? And looking back, how did it inform how he would run the country and deal with the world? I would say he had less of a thought through view, but he had two, or policy, but he had two very strongly held views. And I've seen no evidence that he's changed either one of them. Uh, one is that the costs of America's international involvement far exceeded the benefits. I think he sees foreign policy, if this were a balance sheet in a business, almost entirely on the expenses column, very little on the revenues column. And then secondly, he saw trade as something that was hurting Americans. And uh, I made ar arguments to the contrary on both. I mean, on trade, I said, yes, some Americans have been hurt. Uh, and here's what we can and should do for them. But most of the job losses in recent years are derived from technology and productivity increases. And by the way, here's all the benefits of trade. Uh, I didn't get very far. And then I made the case about the benefits of our position in the world and how history, I thought, had served us pretty well when I looked at the last 70 years. It's been a remarkable stretch, despite our mistakes in Vietnam and Iraq and what have you. But all in all, I thought the return on investment in the world was quite remarkable. And again, I didn't make a dent. So a lot of what the president has done is totally consistent with those deeply held views that he had then as a, uh, as a candidate. By the way, speaking of that, um, imagining a new president uh, that is not Donald Trump, uh, and as I assume that then President Biden would want to rejoin some of the things we've dropped out. You mentioned TPP. Yep. Certainly the climate change accord, I think he has actually said he would rejoin that right away. But of course, that's non-mining, that's not so difficult. Uh, the Iran nuclear deal. How will our erstwhile allies view our request to sort of get um, back in touch again? Or have they lost such trust in the United States over the past two or three years that they're going to be reluctant to let us get involved? I think all in all, they'd welcome it. In principle, I think in the case of the successor to TPP, they would want to, uh, they would be somewhat wary over what conditions we would require because certain things that had been negotiated fell by the wayside after we elected not to go forward and join it. So that would be a complicated negotiation, but I think potentially a successful one. Uh, with the Iran deal, to me, the bigger question of, is not whether we join, but the agree big parts of the agreement, one starts expiring this year, the nuclear things start expiring, what, four years after the new president? You know, it's, they start expiring in 25. So there, to me, the, the durations of the agreement mean that it's already, uh, you know, it's kind of like joining the game in, the, in some cases in the fifth or sixth inning. So I think the bigger question is not whether we join, is what are we, what's a longer term policy towards Iran? What is a new, what if you will, what does JCPOA 2.0 look like? And that's what I would recommend we uh, focus on it. But I'm not fighting your question. I think the general response would be good to have you back. Uh, and you know, there's a lot to work on and something like the World Health Organization. Okay, it's an imperfect organization. It, it made some bad mistakes early on in this crisis. How do we improve the WHO? Do we need to create some complementary or supplementary arrangement? How do we get the, the dozens and dozens of countries that have never met the 2005 international health regulation standards uh, about domestic capabilities? How do we get them where they uh, need to be? I think there's a, a big agenda. So I think in most cases, it'd be, people would be glad to have us uh, around the table with them. Richard, I have a question here from a colleague named Gretchen, Gretchen Baldwin. She, like a lot of the young people at, um, at IPI, are deeply disturbed as we all are by what's happening in this country right now. And so she asked, and they're wondering how to translate that into uh, action in, in the world. So she asked, what do you imagine the global effects will be of these widespread protests against police brutality? And what historical movements, not just American examples, would you suggest both policymakers and those in the streets used to inform their actions going forward? Well, again, as I said before, I think the protest, um, if they're, if, if, let me answer both questions. I think what's critical is these protests have to stay peaceful. Uh, we're, 
we're never going to bring about positive change through looting or, or violence. That's not a political strategy. And the protests ultimately have to lead to action. The answer is not to, you know, we can protest for days, weeks, or months, but we really need to do, and people who are unhappy with the state of things, and I, I fully understand why they are, uh, I am in many ways, that's why we have something called registering and voting and political activity. We've got all sorts of opportunities coming up in the next few months. So I would basically say channel the frustration. And so protests get you, get you up, but then you've got to translate that action into some way into politically uh, meaningful change. And I can't think of any better way than, the, than a lot of the opportunities you know, this November, not just by the way at the presidential level, but a lot of the things we're talking about are at the local level, oversight of police forces and so forth. That's a local issue. And whether it's mayors or, or governors or what have you. So I would think uh, that's what I would hope doing. But I think the, the, the biggest lesson I can suggest is, is nonviolence. Uh, I think the, the looters and the, those doing the arsonists and the rest, they are doing the, the disservice to the memory of George Floyd and essentially to the whole political movement to get rid of racism in this country and to, to create opportunities for Americans. Uh, as you know, Richard, if we were in the headquarters of IPI right now, we would be looking out the window uh, at the United Nations building. Our audiences uh, come from that community and tend to be very international. I want to ask you, I can imagine there may be people out there who don't share your belief in the value of American leadership in the world, who think that the world may be worse off because of the American interventions of recent decades. You know what I'm talking about. How do you respond to that? Well, look, I'm not gonna sit here and say everything we've done is right. I think uh, I was against the Iraq war and I think that was uh, ill-advised by every uh, measure. Uh, not that the situation there before, what shall we say, was in any way ideal or was anything, uh, but I think the American intervention initially in Afghanistan made sense. I think it was important to show that governments that harbor and support terrorists shouldn't expect to be left alone. I think the American intervention in the Gulf War in 1990 and 91, well, it made perfect sense. It made, uh, it was important, if, had we not done that, it would have started the post-Cold War era on the worst possible uh, footing so look i'm not so i can't sit here warren and say we well, always get it right but when i look at the last 70 75 years and i look at the alliance structure i look at institutions this has been the most extraordinary era of history we haven't had great power conflict living standards have gone up dramatically duration of life has gone up dramatically many diseases have gone dramatically uh down there's been much there's much more democracy in the world than there was all in all, not bad. Indeed, I can't find, and I write about that in the book, there's no other era of history that compares. What worries me now is, I mean, is that it may be coming to an end, and I don't see anything better in its place. It'd be one thing if we had something better to substitute for it. Uh, but I don't, I don't see it. I don't see either the consensus for something else, and I don't see any means to bring it about. So Again, I, I come back to the idea the United States can't do anything alone better than it can do it with others, but I don't see an alternative to a successful world uh, that the United States does not play a significant role in. Richard, you've spent a lot of your career, as all foreign services officers of your generation have, in the Middle East, if not physically there, worrying about the Middle East. Um, and I want to ask you about something that's upcoming. If Israel annexes 30% of the West Bank, which it can do starting July 1st, and probably with the, the support of the Trump administration. Will the world help out the Palestinians? Uh, what will be the consequences for Jordan and other US Arab allies? Just to be clear, I was not a foreign service officer. I served in the State Department several times, but I was just a itinerant academic uh, who ended up there. Look, I think there's a decent chance that could happen. I think it would be extraordinarily unfortunate for uh, Jordan and for the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty. I think there's legitimate questions about whether that peace treaty could survive and whether this could bring in stability to Jordan, which has been one of the foundation stones of what stability there's been in the Middle East now for, for decades. 
Uh, I think it's bad for Israel. I think by further diminishing the prospects for a two-state solution, it increases the odds that the day is fast arriving when Israel will have to choose between being democratic and being Jewish. And I think that would be a truly, truly, truly tragic uh, choice for Israel. And I think all this is bad for Palestinians because they their chances of getting a state of their own uh, f- go further and further uh, off. And you know, the passage of time has hurt Palestinians. They made, I think, a lot of uh, bad choices. They're divided now, which makes them, shall we say, a, a suboptimal negotiating partner. But I have no confidence that the the line put out that the plan published by this administration and that's embraced by the Israeli government. Uh, I do not see it as a recipe for peace. Uh, uh, Richard, we at IPI, our researchers, tend to spend quite a bit of time worrying about uh, Africa, individual African countries, peace operations in Africa. Um, American policy towards Africa is 54 countries, uh, all growing in population, growing in power, uh, with tremendous problems of governance, but also some very positive aspects. What should United States policy in Africa be, in other words, to encourage those positive aspects of the continent? Look, I think, I think your setup's exactly right. You know, there's 54 countries, an incredible range from great you know, and promising successes to countries in between to some real failures. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for Africa over the coming decades, two big challenges. One will be population. Africa is the the projected venue of the greatest increase in population in the world. And the question is, how are these people going to be employed? How are they going to be cared for? And I worry about the the resource drain, if you will, of these large populations. I worry about the political implications of having large numbers of uh, unemployed uh, young men in, in particular. So I think a- Africa has enormous challenges. The other, as you suggested, is governance, and bad governance, whether it's non-representative, whether it's corrupt, what have you. So I think the best thing we can do is through trade and aid is to offer conditional help and to basically help Africa uh, uh, in everything from building up stronger public health systems to better, uh, to stronger democracies, to better educational systems. But it's all got to be, and it can be done through assistance. It can also be done through trade, which is less prone to uh, to corruption. But I think it's got to be real partnership. I, I always like the Millennium Challenge uh, Corporation the idea of uh, working with, with governments that were succeeding and saying, if you reach certain thresholds, here's help we can give you and we agree on the project, I would probably lower the thresholds so we could help governments that hadn't gotten as far, far along. But essentially, conditional help that would promote good governance and smart economic uh, act- activity, because it has to happen. Because again, the population wave coming to Africa plus other waves uh, like climate change. I mean, Africa has got enormous, enormous challenges that are, I think, inevitably part of its future. Uh, Richard, um, I know from conversations, and you must have many more of them than I have because you have more friends in the foreign service and in diplomacy than I do, uh, of the uh, incredible morale problems right now. I'm speaking now about the U.S. State Department. All those empty desks, I think it's on the seventh floor, is it, where all the deputies and assistant secretaries sit? Um, Sixth and seventh. um, If you were, and you may be asked to give advice to young diplomats, but if you were, what would you tell diplomats right now in the face of what's going on? Well, I think it'd be be hard right now. I'm I'm really sad to say what I'm going to say, but if I were still teaching and the brightest students came to me and say, should I choose this as a career? I couldn't say right now it's a good choice. I would think um, I'd want to see certain things happen. So I'd want to see new leadership at the State Department. I'd want to see diplomats respected and applauded rather than denigrated. I'd want to see diplomacy respected and applauded rather than uh, denigrated. I'd want to see more resources go there for not just early, but mid-career training. I'd probably invite back some people who retired early because they couldn't take it anymore. I'd probably create more openings for lateral entry. Uh, But I would basically make diplomacy and and foreign policy attractive. Look, when I came of age, I chose this field. I didn't choose investment banking or uh, private equity. I guess maybe they didn't exist then, Warren. But uh, 
but this to me was the most exciting thing I could do. And what I think the challenge is, is to make it exciting and promising and interesting and the best and brightest will, will gravitate toward us. I mean, there's nothing more satisfying. Like I said, government at its best, there's nothing better. And I've, I've, when I worked, say, for four years with Brent Scowcroft and Bob Gates at the National Security Council for the 41st president, for George Herbert Walker Bush, that was as good of an experience I've ever had in my life. It doesn't get better than that when you've got, you're working with really smart, talented people. You've got purpose. Uh, you're working hard for things you believe in. You're hopefully doing some good. I mean, uh, what an opportunity that is to be a part of history that actually has a positive legacy. So government at its best is a, a great, great calling. What's so sad is to see, uh, in many cases, what's become of it. By the way, just beginning this conversation, talking about your book, uh, and you were saying that, that decision making should be informed by, by knowledge, by history, by experience. In your own experience um, at the State Department and as a diplomat, um, were you always around people that would suggest in conversations things that had happened 10 or 15 or 20 years before? Or, uh, well, quite a lot. Three, this with, is a lesson. This is an indication of what we should be doing. Quite a lot with diplomats, because uh, a lot of them had said, oh, we tried this in the Middle East. Yeah, there's, there's not all that new under the sun sometimes, or this in Europe, or this with the Soviets. So history is useful. Yeah. The, uh, both Arabic and Hebrew have very good expression. Their equivalents, nothing new under the sun. Uh, the, um, so, look, history is always good, but it's also a good guide for policymaking. When I used to teach, one of the best books was a book called Thinking in Time, The Use of History for Decision Making. And, I, and there were times I argued history, not that it was, uh, you know, it's never identical, but more as a, as a lesson, as a guide. And for example, when we were faced in 1991 with the decision of whether to go to Baghdad, I wrote a memo and talked to the president about the downsides of changing and expanding war aims in the flush of tactical advance in a war. And I talked about what happened to Truman and MacArthur in 1950 when they went north of the 38th parallel in Korea, and it was a debacle. And I said, we have to be really, really careful about going down uh, that, that track. And so I think, you, you know, look, if I could talk about the training for any want to be diplomat i would say you history should be one important part of your uh of your learnings the reason i created you know i made the first fourth of the book the first quarter of the book a history section i thought that you just needed this grounding to it's like an ante in a game of poker you needed this to get into the game just to understood how we got to where we are you need to go to 1648 to understand it all I'm thinking the yes. Treaty of Westphalia. That's where you begin. Treaty of Westphalia, yes. Treaty of Westphalia, yes. 1648 is an important launching spot. That is the creation of the, the modern international system. Uh, Richard, your mention of something you did in the, in the first Bush administration reminds me that one of the books that you wrote and that we had you come and talk here was, it was the book called War of Necessity, uh, War of Choice. About yes, sir. The new Iraq wars, and you had participation in both of them for separate bushes. Um, Richard, it was great to have you come and talk about the book back then, and it was great to have you come talk about it today. Thanks so much. Thanks, and stay, uh, stay safe and stay well, my friend.